Hi, my name is Dr. David Kella. Today we're going to talk about what is a hiatal hernia. So we're going to discuss everything you need to know about hiatal hernias, the causes, diagnosis, signs, symptoms, the four types and treatment options, both alternative and allopathic. So let's get into it. Hernia is when an internal part of the body pushes into an area where it doesn't belong. In the case of a hiatal hernia, when eating, food will travel down the esophagus, which passes through a small opening, the hiatus, in the diaphragm before entering the stomach. The lower esophageal sphincter, or LES, is a valve that opens to let food in and closes to keep digestive acids and food in your stomach. Now, the LES, or lower esophageal sphincter, at the top of the stomach, when the diaphragm's opening weakens, the stomach and um, LES valve protrude through the hiatus and diaphragm. When the top portion of the stomach either rolls or slides up into this opening and becomes stuck there, it becomes a hiatal hernia. Now, the LES valve cannot close correctly with a piece of the stomach wedged through the enlarged hiatal hole. So, what are hiatal hernia signs and symptoms? And they can be confusing and sort of all over the place. So, Many small hiatal hernias cause no signs or symptoms, but larger hiatal hernias can cause a lot of different symptoms, such as heartburn, regurgitation of food or liquids into the mouth, backflow of stomach acid into the esophagus, acid reflux, difficulty swallowing chest or abdominal, feeling full soon after you eat, Shortness of breath is also very common. Vomiting of blood or passing of black stools, which may indicate gastrointestinal bleeding. If there's blood in the stool and it's bright red, that's something different, possibly a hemorrhoid. But stomach acid refluxing back up into the esophagus is one of the earlier, more common symptoms. This causes people to experience heartburn, inflammation, uh, esophageal spasms, and sometimes ulcers or worse, cancer. Unfortunately, hiatal hernia gets misdiagnosed because it mimics many other disorders. A person with gastroesophageal reflux disease, GERD, may experience stomach aches Uh, that feel like an ulcer, chest pains, sometimes mimicking cardiac arrest. A common mistake we see is treating the symptoms with medications or worse, surgery. Now, it's important to understand that many people believe their stomach acid is producing too much hydrochloric acid and they run for the Tums. And antacids increase your chances of bone fractures, breaks, and developing osteoporosis. And as you get older, that's the last thing you need and want. So poor posture is another one, or scoliosis. Those can make a hiatal hernia worse by altering the stomach's position, causing the hernia to squeeze the neighboring vagus nerve. The vagus nerve stimulates the release of hydrochloric acid via the proton pump. This causes over or under secretion of hydrochloric acid. It may also relax the pyloric sphincter at the bottom of the stomach, causing leakage of digestive juices that are needed to break food down properly. Researchers found the University of Michigan Medical School cases where hiatal hernias were responsible for heart palpitations due to stimulation of the vagus nerve. So suppose a person develops poor digestion due to decreased hydrochloric acid. In that case, they'll have difficulty assimilating and digesting minerals and proteins, causing food putrefaction in the intestines and toxicity throughout the body. Lack of nutrition and toxicity 
may contribute to anemia, constipation, difficulty swallowing, food allergies, and immune system weakness. Gastric acid from decayed and fermented food can cause throat spasms that lead to thyroid gland irritation. Hiatal hernia sufferers frequently complain of not getting vitamins or large pills down, especially when they're capsules. So what causes a hiatal hernia? We spoke about posture and scoliosis that could be some aggravating causes. The causes of hiatal hernia really are not entirely known and can be unique to each individual. There could be a mechanical cause, blows to the abdomen, hard coughing, obesity, a stressful event, and more frequently found poor posture or hyperkyphosis. These contribute to the development of this problem. But incorrect lifting may be the most damaging mechanical cause. If air is not exhaled from the lungs while lifting, the intra-abdominal pressure may force the stomach through the diaphragm. This happens to weightlifters that don't breathe properly. Remember, when you take deep breath in, you're increasing abdominal pressure by lowering the diaphragm. When you exhale, you raise the diaphragm, reducing abdominal pressure. Now, most patients presenting with severe hiatal hernias are under extreme stress and sympathetic nervous system overload. Another cause could be a defect that wasn't symptomatic for a long time or the medications are no longer helping to mask your symptoms. Okay, let's get right into the four types of hiatal hernias. Now, don't get confused. Some divided into two types, sliding and esophageal. Others go another step and leave out the fourth type. Number one, the most common type, oftentimes misdiagnosed, I'll explain further, is type one, sliding hiatal hernia, which accounts for 85 to 90% of cases. Then you have type two, three, and four hiatal hernia, which account for five to 15% of cases. A type two or esophageal hernia results from a localized defect in the phrenoesophageal membrane, while the gastroesophageal mem uh, junction, excuse me, remains fixed to the pre-aortic fascia and the median arcuate ligament. Type three hernias have elements of both type one and type two hernias with progressive enlargement of the hernia through the hiatus. The phrenoesophageal membrane stretches. This displaces the gastroesophageal junction above the diaphragm, thereby adding a sliding element of the type two hernia. Now, the natural history of a type 2 hernia is progressive enlargement so that the entire stomach eventually herniates, performing an upside down intrathoracic stomach. Parasophageal type 2 hernias are associated with abnormal laxity of structures, normally preventing displacement of the stomach in the first place. The gastrosplenic and gastrocolic ligaments specifically. As the hernia enlarges, the greater curvature of the stomach rolls up into the thorax because the stomach is fixed at the gastroesophageal junction. The herniated stomach tends to rotate around its longitudinal axis, resulting in a volvulus. Gastric volvulus may lead to acute gastric obstruction incarceration, and worse, perforation. You would want to rule that out with an upper GI barium study. Last but not least, type four hiatal hernias are characterized by herniation of the stomach along with associated viscera, such as the spleen, the colon, small bowel, and pancreas through the esophageal hiatus. They are relatively rare, representing only 5% of hernias and um, are associated with severe complications. Differentiating among these types depends upon a subjective assessment of cardia integrity, reproducibility of which has yet to be demonstrated. An analysis of about 273 endoscopies found a direct relationship between the magnitude of the cardia circumference as viewed in retroflexion 
and the presence and severity of GERD. All right, let's talk about the mobility of the esophagastric junction. The definition of a type 1 hiatal hernia is dependent on the anatomic relationship of the distal esophagus, hiatus, and stomach. However, it's important to recognize that this relationship and distance changes. The contraction of the longitudinal layer of the esophageal muscles is associated with esophageal shortening, and the distal end must elevate with shortening. Thus, physiological herniation occurs during primary peristalsis, secondary peristalsis, esophageal distension, and lower esophageal sphincter relaxation. The mobility of the esophogastric junction makes it so difficult to standardize the assessment and measurement of a type 1 hiatal hernia. Furthermore, since much of the axial motion of the esophogastric junction occurs in the setting of a closed esophageal lumen, it's not readily detectable using imaging modalities such as endoscopy, barium contrast radiography that require an open distended lumen to assess the esopho esophagogastric junction position. There lies the problem and the difficulty in assessing type 1 hiatal hernias. The assessment itself is greatly influenced by the method of measurement, as I just spoke about. What is capable radiographically is different from what is demonstrable endoscopically or manometrically. Now, that leads me to how we diagnose hiatal hernias. The radiographic demonstration of a sliding hiatus hernia is usually done with a barium swallow examination in order to demonstrate the relative positions of the esophagogastric junction and the diaphragmatic hiatus. The positions of these structures must be visible radiographically, which means the esophagus must be distended with shortening and displacement of the esophagogastric junction. Recognition of this effect led to the two centimeter rule, wherein there must be more than two centimeter separation between the B ring and the diaphragmatic hiatus before being considered a sliding hiatal hernia. Another very common test is an endoscopic assessment of sliding type 1 hiatal hernia. There has been little uniformity applied to the assessment of sliding hiatal hernias with endoscopy. Sliding hiatal hernia is diagnosed when the apparent separation between the squamo-columnar junction and the diaphragmatic impression is greater than 2 centimeters. The variability of endoscopic interpretation of signs consistent with reflux, including hiatal hernia, was recently the subject of an experiment in which 120 endoscopists were asked to interpret the identical two-minute video of an upper endoscopy. Half of the participants were given a patient history consistent with reflux and the other half a patient history of epigastric pain. 42% of the group, given the reflux history, reported endoscopic findings consistent with reflux, as opposed to only 12% given a history of epigastric pain. In summary, there has been little study of the sensitivity or reproducibility of the endoscopic grading and measurement of sliding hiatal hernias. What information does exist suggests that endoscopy suffers from similar limitations to barium swallow radiography, but is probably even more subjective because of additional confounding factors. Unless a strict protocol for measurement is tightly adhered to, the identification of type 1 hernias less than 3 centimeters in size with endoscopy is unreliable. Furthermore, because of a lack of standardization in the convention of when the size measurement of a type 1 hernia is taken with respect to entry, exit, and the extent of gastric distension, 
the size estimate has an inherent two centimeter error from the start. So the accuracy and the reproducibility of these measurements has not been tested, but are conceptually vulnerable to the same limitations as measurements made during a barium swallow radiography. Another approach to the endoscopic grading of sliding hiatus hernia is to assess the appearance of the EGJ from a retroflexed position and to incorporate an assessment of hiatal integrity along with the assessment of axial displacement. Type 1 sliding hiatal hernia results from laxity and loss of elasticity of the phrenoesophageal ligament. Endoscopy and radiography are relatively insensitive in the detection of small type 1 hiatal hernias because the exam triggers esophageal shortening and physiological herniation. Last, we have high resolution manometry with pressure topography plotting. This allows for precise location of the physiological elements of the esophagogastric junction. What are my treatment options and how can I get relief? Well, let's start with the least invasive non-surgical approach. Hiatal hernia is predominantly a mechanical problem. We spoke about the diaphragm and muscle weakness and laxicity but we didn't discuss the nerves that control the diaphragm, which come from the phrenic nerve operating or originating at the neck C3 through C5. And then carrying both motor and sensory and sympathetic nerve supply. If we look closer at the spine and nerve supply at T6 through T9, to other areas like the stomach, esophagus, lower esophageal sphincter, all controlled by the vagus nerve. In fact, all muscles and tendons and ligaments get their messages and orders from the different regions of the spine. Now you can understand the utmost importance of including chiropractic care if you have been diagnosed with a hiatal hernia. Another safe and effective tool in some chiropractor's tool belt is a safe and extremely effective maneuver called the hiatal hernia maneuver. And when coupled with chiropractic adjustments, it's even more effective at correcting a type one hiatal hernia. Using the hiatal hernia maneuver along with cold laser therapy to relax the abdominal wall, reduces swelling and pain as well. We have successfully treated so many cases of type one sliding hiatal hernia. Now for type two parasophageal hernia, because it's a defect, you won't completely correct that, but you can prevent a gastric volvulus, intrathoracic stomach, and some, if not all, of the symptoms can be relieved significantly using the maneuver more gently. With an esophageal hernia type 2, proper tests we just spoke about need to be done to rule out a gastric volvulus. Most common approach I see is medications. Doesn't make it the right approach for everyone. In fact, I would say for most, if you experience heartburn and acid reflux, your doctor may recommend antacids that neutralize stomach acid. Antacids such as Mylanta, Rolaids, and Tums may provide quick relief. But overuse antacids or overusing antacids can cause side effects such as diarrhea, osteoporosis, or sometimes kidney problems. Then we have medications to reduce acid production. These medications known as H2 receptor blockers include um, Tagamint and Pepsid and Axid, a bunch of different names for these drugs, these PPIs. Stronger versions are available by prescription and medications that block acid production and heal the esophagus, these medications known as PPIs or proton pump inhibitors are stronger acid blockers than H2 receptor blockers and allow time for damaged esophageal tissue to heal. Over the counter proton pump inhibitors include Prevacid 24 hour and Prilosec and Zegarid. Stronger versions are available in prescription form, but beware all medications have side effects. And finally, we have surgery. 
I saved that for last because you should too. Sometimes a hiatal hernia requires surgery, probably about 1.2% of cases. Surgery is generally used for people who aren't helped by the hiatal hernia maneuver, medications to relieve heartburn and acid reflux, or have complications such as severe inflammation or narrowing of the esophagus. Surgery to repair a hiatal hernia may involve pulling your stomach down into your abdomen and making the opening in your diaphragm smaller or reconstructing an esophageal sphincter. In some cases, hiatal hernia surgery is combined with weight loss surgery, such as a sleeve gastrectomy. Surgery may be performed using a single incision in your chest wall or using a minimally invasive technique called laparoscopy. In laparoscopic surgery, your surgeon inserts a tiny camera and special surgical tools through several small incisions in your abdomen. The operation is then performed while your surgeon views images from inside your body that are displayed on a video monitor. If you learned anything from this video and have gained more insight into hiatal hernias and your treatment options, I hope you can give me a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. Thank you so much for tuning in. I appreciate all of you. See you soon.